Hello and good day to everyone. My name is Kerry Roberts and I'm with Think JSAL from the Joint Special Operations University located in Tampa, Florida. I want to welcome everyone to another online interview series that explores research and publications of JSAL faculty, resident senior fellows, leading academics, and the wider SOF international security community. Our Think JSAL online collection of interviews with authors and researchers is a supplement to our publication series. We encourage you to view future offerings on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and APAN, the All Partner Access Network. Today, as part of our Great Power Competition Series, we would like to welcome Dr. Sulman Khan. Dr. Khan is an Associate Professor of International History and Chinese Foreign Relations and teaches at the Fletcher School, Tufts University. He is the author of Haunted by Chaos, China's Grand Strategy from Mao Zedong to Xi Jinping, Harvard University Press, 2018 which was named a top book of 2018 by the American Interest and is listed on the U.S. SOCOM Commander's Reading List, and he has also earned a PhD from Yale University. He has written for The Economist, Foreign Affairs, and The American, with research interest in Chinese foreign relations, international security, and international history. Dr. Khan, I want to thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me, Kerry. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Well, first off, provide a brief overview of the thesis of your book, and in particular, I'm really curious about why you chose the title Haunted by Chaos when addressing China. Thanks very much. So the thesis of the book is that if you look at Chinese policy from Mao Zedong to now, there is a consistent, if not completely consistent, but reasonably consistent grand strategy to the way China approaches the world. Um, what do I mean by grand strategy? I mean the relationship of means to ends, um, using different categories of power to achieve national goals. Um, that sounds kind of straightforward, but there's something more comprehensive about grand strategy than the way we do policy, for example. Um, Russians are doing something in Ukraine. What do we do about it now? Uh, China's doing something in the South China Sea. What do we do about it now? Whereas with grand strategy, there's something more overarching. How do these different problems in the world relate to one another? And how, this is the step most people skip, do they relate to what we want in the world? And at that point, what do we do about it? And the argument of the book is that China has an overarching goal of securing the state and military, diplomatic, and economic power geared towards that. Now, securing the state sounds kind of simplistic, but then you think of some of the goals that have been ascribed to China. Um, China wants to take over the world. China wants to displace the United States. Um, and you begin to see it's not quite that simplistic after all. Um, simply securing the state is the main goal. Um, displacement of the U.S. as a hegemon might happen, but it would be in service of that larger goal, not as a goal unto itself. The other reason to not take this idea of securing the state lightly is if you think about both Chinese history and Chinese geography. So the people we talk about in the book, um, Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, Xi Jinping, they all have an experience of a state that has been broken um, at different points. Mao, of course, had to cobble the state together from a bunch of basically balkanized warring statelets, if you would. Um, the there are memories of- The period. Like the this is the period. civil war period. Yeah, the warlord era. Um, there is a memory of the warlord era. There are stories of the opium wars that get told, and these resonate with people, much like stories of the Civil War, the Revolutionary War here resonate with us. Um, they have a similar resonance. There's a memory of the Cultural Revolution, when China literally tore itself apart. Um, there's a memory of the Tiananmen Square protests and how those threatened to break the state down. So taking the state's existence and integrity for granted is simply not something leaders in Beijing are mentally equipped to do. Um, you wake up, if you're a Chinese leader, worried about, will this thing we call the PRC hold together, not just today, but tomorrow? And then if you think about Chinese geography, you look at the long porous coast and you look at those vulnerable land frontiers, and you begin to realize that security-wise, they're in a very different situation from a country that has three oceans, Canada and Mexico um, around it. The nature of the problems you have to deal with, if you have North Korea on one end, um, Pakistan on the other, is completely different. So that sense of chaos, and Chinese leaders do use that word often, very often indeed, 
that's something that resonates in grand strategic planning there. Um, and it's something that's defined the way they approach the world to this day. Okay. So you argue further in your book, uh, since China's not settled its internal problems, mm -hmm. do you argue these problems will continue into the future as it, mm -hmm. as it strives to rise to the level of a global power? That's correct. I think the interesting thing with China is that great power and great insecurity go together over there. Indeed, as it's got stronger, the sense of there being more to lose and more vulnerabilities adding up um, has become more and more intense. If you think about the nature of China's problems, um, environmental change being the most obvious one, right? Chinese civilization grew up around rivers. Now the rivers threaten to run dry. What do you do about that? Um, if you think about slowing economy and what that means for people right now, especially given that the economy is meant to be the foundation of military strength. If you think about corruption, um, these are things that aren't going anywhere. They are in some ways things that have got worse with great power. As you grow economically, you do environmental damage. As you grow economically, the risks of corruption go up. Um, as you become more and more involved in the rest of the world, the different agencies of government acquire an almost inevitable lack of supervision. So their sense of internal problems besetting the state hasn't gone away. And I would suggest that as the state grows more powerful, um, those are only going to get worse. Indeed, indeed. Uh, so there's a lot of talk here in the United States in the national security community. You know, we have the new national defense strategy that came out mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, a new administration. Uh, there's a lot of talk about China being a near peer competitor with the United States. Is that an apt description in, in, in your view? And further, what does that mean for the USA in national security terms? And, and for us in JSAL, we're thinking about the soft community, the special operations community. Mm -hmm. I think the first thing to say is that near peer competitors strikes me at least as a little misleading. If you think of the capacity of the United States to project power worldwide, right, um, just about every corner of the globe, that's something China doesn't yet have. Um, it's a regional power right now. Um, can China go toe to toe with the United States in the waters of South America? Probably not. Can it project power to the same extent the United States can? Probably not. Economically, despite talk about reserve currencies that would replace the dollar, um, that hasn't happened yet. And indeed, with the current economic slowdown China's facing, exacerbated by corona, of course, um, that seems a much farther way off. Um, so it's not a near peer competitor. It is a competitor in certain spheres, and it can undermine US interests in those spheres. If you think about China-Iran relations, for example, um, that's a place where sanctions can be thwarted, weapons can be sold in a way that runs counter to professed US goals. The question for the United States, I think, is, and this goes back to what we were saying about the definition of grand strategy, what is it that we want in the world? And that's a conversation that hasn't yet happened. Much of the discussion I see about China is, um, China's power is growing, what do we do about it? It's an important conversation to have, but it's a conversation that to my mind can't be conducted constructively until you first have the conversation of what is it that we want in the world? Um, in a way, what we saw with both the Trump administration and the debate running up to the 2016 election was an argument for retrenchment, right? Um, maybe let the allies do more different tones of having that argument, but maybe let the allies do more. Uh, maybe focus more on what's happening at home. Um, there's also an argument for an overambitious grand strategy, right? We have to project power every corner of the globe and stay number one. Um, that's something that the United States has still not settled. So I would suggest the first thing to do would be to settle on that. Um, run up to the presidential election is a great time to have a conversation about our purpose in the world. And then we can decide what to do about China. Okay. Well, I think uh, if I could just have my own personal observation, this ongoing crisis with the, this virus mm -hmm. um, and the economic slowdown that is incurred as a result is making these questions all the more relevant. Absolutely. Uh, for our, for our, the, the thinkers and the thought leaders in the national security community, especially in the time of a presidential election. Yeah. So 
you know, th these things are relevant for all American citizens, not just the soft community, but, but in particular, the soft community, which we at JSAO are concerned about. So Dr. Khan, again, I want to thank you for your time. Um, I wish you all the best in your future research uh, and, and looking forward to more publications. Uh, and hopefully you get back on the, on the SOCOM reading list, uh, SOCOM commander's reading list, rather, uh, in the future. So looking forward to reading more of your publications. Thanks very much, Gary. You're very welcome. It's been an honor well, and a pleasure. Wonderful. It's great to have you. Thank you again for sharing your time, Dr. Khan. I'm sure many in the soft community will find our discussion enlightening as great power competition continues to grow in importance for the soft community in the future. Upcoming topics on our online interview series include more authors from the U.S. SOCOM Commander's Reading List, as well as current research conducted by JSAL faculty and senior fellows. For feedback on Think JSAL or to nominate potential speakers, please contact us at thinkjsal at socom.mil. In the meantime, you can follow JSAL on LinkedIn and Facebook, or you can check out upcoming courses and events on our website, which is www.socom.mil slash JSAL. That's J-S-O-U. This series is brought to you by the Strategic Studies Department of the Joint Special Operations University. Thank you all for listening.